Well, good morning. Good morning. We hope you're here to get efficient with Visual Studio Code. If you're not, very carefully don't disturb your neighbors as you make your way out. Otherwise, buckle in. We're ready to go. Who are you? I'm not Zane Turner. And I am not Renee Win Winkelmeyer. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, we'd like to welcome you to our session, Be an Efficient Salesforce Developer with VS Code. And our very first question would be, before you see the most awesome slide, uh -huh. is who is using VS Code already today? OK, great. Awesome. So your slide. Ready? Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Did you turn this on? Yes. No, you didn't. There we go. Getting even more efficient already. So <laughs> the first time you will see this most important slide where we want you to remember that as a publicly traded company, if you came here to make purchasing decisions, first of all, Renee and I would really question whether or not you should be in this session. But if you did come here for that, we want you to make your decisions based on our currently available, completely awesome technology, not any of the forward-looking statements that we may make here today. Cool? There we go. Got to know that you're alive this morning. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and please remember this slide because you will see it many, 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 many times this week. All right. So who, we, who are we? Um, that's me, not on the right with a bear, obviously. Um, I live in Germany. Zane lives. I live in Oregon. Yeah, Portland, I heard. And we are two developers. We are using the same tools. We work in. With we work on the same projects. We're committing to the same repos. We're often overriding each other's code, or complementing each other's code, or fighting about each other's code. And um, as you can see, we have two or more different working styles depending on the given day and the day and time. <laughs> and we share a tool. And we share a tool, VS Code, with our Salesforce extensions. But yes. I'm not talking about that. What you will learn in this session, or what we want to show you, is a basic introduction into VS Code, how to use the Salesforce extensions for VS Code, and the most important part, how you can apply this to your day-to-day -day development. Mm -hmm. Who's using VS Code, because many people raised their hand, VS Code nowadays for their day-to-day -day development in Salesforce? Okay. Okay, that's only a few. Right. Who's using another IDE for their day-to-day -day development? OK, awesome. Is, who's using Eclipse to fill that role right now? Who's using Sublime Text or some other kind of editor? OK, cool. OK, yeah, yeah. Illuminated Cloud, oh, yep. Awesome. OK. Are <coughs> we into the demos now? Enough slides? One more slide. Oh, one and more slide. One more slide. Our use case. Our use case. So who's seen the sample gallery, the sample apps gallery? If you haven't, you can bookmark the, it's on Trailhead, and we will share the link to it. But uh, the sample gallery are different sample applications where you can go check out best practices for design patterns, architecture patterns, if you want to explore how to use a particular feature. It's all, we've pulled them all together. There are five of them right now, and we're going to be using one of those sample apps, a little sample app called DreamHouse, which some of you may have seen in different places. So we're going to be walking through some, two, as two developers, working on the DreamHouse real estate application today. Cool. So having said that, no more slides. And I'm old. I have to sit. So we're starting here in VS Code, and obviously what you see is that you don't see a lot, right? Um, this is a very starting screen of VS Code. Many of you are, as, as you raised your hands, are familiar with the starting screen. But we want to give you a brief introduction of the basic navigation elements within VS Code. My biggest pet peeve in the tool itself are keystrokes. I'm not a big fan of the mouse or a trackpad, and I can be most efficient in keystrokes, which is VS Code's best strength, in my opinion. For those who haven't played with the tool yet, you have on the left side your navigation bar. This is your explorer, where you can open projects and have other things available, like the outline. Uh, we have a search. We have built-in source control, for example, Git. We have some debugging capabilities. and the most important part, in my opinion, extensions. Because VS Code is only 
a small, slick Electron app that you can use with a lot of extensions to make it your own. And I mean, we as developers, we'd like to make an IDE our own, right? I mean, we can talk about what is my IDE and how do I like to format my code? And likely this is a war between developers, right? So we, it's like, we agree sometimes. It's great that we can each have our own IDE the way we like it. Exactly, exactly. So this extensions bar gives you direct access to the VS Code marketplace. Why don't you search for one? Like, show us like, what's up with JavaScript, just so we get a, si a sense of why we also like the VS Code ecosystem. Exactly. So this is like, when I do JavaScript development and I have to zoom in a bit, so you can see the small progress bar, there are a lot of extensions, a lot. And I say a lot. So you will likely you know, spend days finding the right extension for your, for your task, yep. but it gives you the power to really make the extension your own. And I, I'm coming from Eclipse. Exactly. And I, and I can tell you the Eclipse marketplace was okay-ish, mm -hmm. because I didn't, you know, sometimes didn't find the right thing that I needed or I wanted. And with VS Code, I have a wealth of extensions that I can use. And this is a pattern you're going to see over and over again. It's not only that there's an extensions marketplace, but the extensions that you're going to find in VS Code, those of you that are using other, like the marketplaces around, Sublime Text is kind of an example, but maybe more if you're using Atom or these other things, the extensions that you will find are also going to be more targeted. You're not going to get then these massive libraries that are installing a whole bunch of other things that you may not necessarily want in order to then just be able to work with Java or .NET. You're going to get better, more targeted extensions for, I want to control this aspect of the IDE, or I want to do this specific thing. So it's worth spending some time looking around that marketplace and seeing exactly what extensions are out there. Exactly. So I want to close this sidebar and with my command B, and I can just get rid of this, which is really helpful, because when you have only one screen, or sometimes I have three screens at home, but I need real estate as a developer. And I just don't want to fiddle with the mouse to move the taskbar back and forth. So command B just opens my last window or closes this. So let's go actually to our use case. I am the Apex developer, just that you know, the backend expert. And Zane. I'm playing the role of our Lightning developer today. Exactly. So together, exactly. we're going to build an app. Exactly. So I'm going to my Explorer, and I'm opening our project. We have here a standard Salesforce DX project. And I'm going to open, just from the standard tree, my Apex class, which we call my property controller. And as the people in the last row will see, you can't see a lot, right? Because we often figured especially in, de in demonstrations. I like the black theme, but it's not great for demos. So what I will do now is I'm going to code, and I can check in my preferences a color theme, which I will do. And I think light Visual Studio code will light up go. the room, right? And so this I'm, is so another place where there are more extensions that can change it radically. And this is just built in. We get a, quite, a few, quite a few color themes with Visual Studio code. Exactly. So. The people in the first row, please put on your sunglasses because this is really light. And as I'm working or will work on my Apex class, I also want to take a look at the lightning component that Zane is working on. So I'm using now my similar properties lightning component, which I can find here in the tree. And I need some real estate. Now I have to move the mouse a bit. And usually you click on this or you open a tab, and then you have to switch between tabs, which I really don't like. Which I, I want to see my, my code on screen. So I'm using Command B to close this, and you can easily drag this to the side and have your code side by side, which is really neat, especially you know, on, on a real estate IDE. Having said that, Zane, what's up with your Lightning component? What do you want to build with it? Ah, so I will take over now. And this probably looks like a very familiar screen. I'm also in Visual Studio Code. I've also enabled the light theme so that we can all see. And I need to open up my lightning component. And as Renee said, clicking is not always what we want to do. So I'm going to use another series of shortcuts. Um, because I'm on a Mac, I'm using Shift-Command-P. And I'm getting to then, this is the command palette, that thing popping down in the center of the screen. And for now, I'm going to delete this angle bracket. We'll come back to that. But now you can see that the menu has changed because I'm now automatically searching within my project. That's what I can just do. And I need to go ahead and open up that similar properties. And you see I've typed 
S-I-M-I. -I. I don't know if my Zoom is going to show it as beautifully. There we go. And then actually, I know that I want the component, so then I'm just going to do, and we get these partial search, so I can target even within my project pretty easily and nicely. So I'm going to open up my similar properties component, zoom back out. And I actually also need my design file for this. So again, I'm going to just search for my .design and open it up. And because I didn't click fast enough, I'll just go, look, it, when I lost that file and I brought my tree back open, it took me to the place in the project where I was anchored, so I didn't lose my place. So the fact that I lost my similar properties component markup is no biggie, because I can just go ahead and open everything right here from the sidebar. OK, so because Renee and I are super efficient, what we're doing here is we have a, a component called similar properties that you can probably guess what it does is it shows properties that are similar in a lovely list. We're using an Apex controller to determine what we mean by similar. And our companies asked us to give more flexibility there. We need to give them some options about, well, what's similar? Is it the same number of bedrooms? Is it the same price range? What are we doing here? So I'm going to do that by adding design attributes into our Lightning component so that then when we're working in Lightning App Builder, someone who's in that interface can decide how to run the query. So we are super efficient, and we put all of our code snippets <laughs> in text files today. So I'm just going to grab this and get it on my clipboard. Uh, and we haven't brought them through a pull request, right? No. So we just edit that here. Yeah, no. These are just locally on my machine, uh, so we can copy and paste together and save some time. So I've added my design attribute. That's fantastic. And the next thing I need to do is to make sure that my controller code is aiming at the new method, as I've indicated here, that Renee and I have agreed he's going to write called get similar properties. Everything's looking good. So now what I want to do is I want to push this to the development environment where I'm working. So I'm going to use my command palette again. And this time, I'm not getting rid of that angle bracket. And I'm going to zoom in. and. Or, uh, or not, whatever. And you can see now that I'm getting all of these SFDX commands because I have automatic awareness of the Salesforce CLI in Visual Studio Code. So that angle bracket means I'm now scoping two commands that I can execute. And these are all the Salesforce CLI commands showing up here. And I actually want to go ahead and push source to the default scratch org. So if I don't remember the syntax of that command, I can run it right here from the command palette pretty easily. And Renee is probably wondering when I'm going to get to, how did I get that into Visual Studio Code? Who has that awareness built into their Visual Studio Code instance yet? See a few hands. If you don't and you want it, what you want to do is go to the extensions marketplace again. And I've scoped mine by at installed, because I have it installed. But you want to look for the Salesforce extensions. And if I open this up and get rid of my terminal window here. Let's scope this down so that we can see. The Salesforce extensions for Visual Studio Code are going to give you a whole bunch of goodness. But they're going to give you things like that CLI integration. That's what I showed right there. They're going to give you the ability to have Apex code editing and language services, which we're going to look at. We're going to, you're going to get access to the Apex replay debugger, which we are going to look at in just a minute here. You're going to get a whole bunch of stuff if you would go ahead and install the Salesforce extensions for VS Code. Those are the ones that we as a company have dedicated to developing and supporting right now. And it's part of this marketplace of extensions that you can get. One thing that's noteworthy. Many of you have likely heard about Salesforce DX, and you, know, you can use it with Scratch Org. But now, yeah. as of in beta now, you can use this with any kind of org. So the CLI was always something, as long as you could establish a trusted connection, whether you're using a Jot or using the web login capabilities of the CLI, which you can do both ways, as long as you could get an authenticated session into an org, you could always use the CLI. And there are several sessions taking place here at Dreamforce that are talking about that. Running queries, checking limits, all those sort of things. A lot of things you might be using Workbench for today. You can also use the CLI for that. But what Renee is talking about is that force source push command that I just ran. There's a, there's a twin of it that now works for non-scratch orgs. I'm talking sandboxes, I'm talking development orgs, production. You can deploy and retrieve source without having to run complex transformations now with the CLI. So it opens up a whole new game for those of you that aren't yet on Scratch Orgs. And which makes now VS Code the IDE for every Salesforce developer. So I pushed my source to my Scratch Org. Um, just trust me, it happened. But what I haven't done yet is uh, opened up my org. So speaking of that authenticated, trusted relationship, I'm now 
looking at, this is another feature in VS Code, is the fact that you can get an integrated terminal. So we have a lot of different tabs here that you can see. So this output tab is showing me everything the CLI is doing for me. And my terminal is an integrated bash session for me on, on a Mac. It would be a command prompt session for you on a Windows machine. So I tend to like to work in the CLI. I like to run the commands myself because I like to know what I'm doing. So I'm going to go ahead and run a force org open. And let's spell it right. And we're going to open my scratch org. And now that we've pushed source, we'll make the changes we need in the UI here. OK, so I'm in my DreamHouse application. I need to edit. It's the property record is what we're dealing with to get that component on there. So I'm going to go to one of the property records. And you can see my component is not on the screen right now. So we'll go into App Builder. And I am going to grab my similar properties component, get it on the page. And Renee. What? <laughs> what are you doing in your Apex? That looks amazing. That looks should like. I switch back to you? You should switch back to me. I think that's a good, good idea. All right. So that happens when you work across different time zones, right? I promise to make things, but when I go to bed, Zane is likely at her noon time. So it often doesn't work out right. sometimes, right? We are ahead. So what I'm, I have to do is I have to add my own ap you know, my Apex method to this. And I'm also the efficient developer because I have it also here in my text file. So let's close this and let's just add it to VS Code. And the very first thing that I see as a developer is, oh my god, this is not really well formatted. Right? I mean, I don't like this. <clears throat> and this is a word of warning. When you use the Salesforce extensions, we currently don't have a code formatter. Right? So when, you, uh, when you're a developer. For person, Apex. For Apex. Right. For Apex. For Apex. There's new, uh, new functionality in the latest release of the CLI that will help you when you're working with Lightning components and things that are HTML-like. There is some formatting now built in through the CLI for that. But when you're on, dealing with Apex, you, it's still not as good as even the good old dev console. Yeah, exactly. So you can use third-party formatters for that that can speak the, Apex, uh, the Java language, for yeah. example. Uncrustify is, is a good extension. And you can see this here at the very bottom. And I'm zooming in here, the small Apex dot. When you click this, you can change the file association for this file. So I could say, uh, this is a Java file. And then it would give me an uh, opportunity that I can format this document as a Java file, for example, which is really handy. Mm -hmm. So now I have this in here. And that looks, I think, pretty good. Let me first save this so that Zane can later reuse it. Um, but this also contains a few really neat features, because we are now in the Apex code editor. And when I work with Apex, I work locally, but I also want to check my things, like you know, whatever I write, my Socle query, for example, is the right Socle query. So what are you doing nowadays? You're going into your org, you open the developer console maybe, you go to the Socle tab and run the query, right? So what I can do from within my Apex class, I can just highlight text. And I don't even have to be in this text file. I can just open, for example, a new file and have my Socle query in here. Then just highlighting this. And I'm using the command palette to run a Socle query. Execute a Socle query with currently selected text, which is pretty neat because I can just write this. I'm using the REST API. It uses under the hood, again, the CLI. And as you can see here, I'm getting my Sockle query data back. It doesn't look well formatted on this resolution, right? I can bring this in a place that I like more, that is much better. But based on this, I can see data, which is in ARC, and I can work in my Apex code directly from, from in VS Code. As you're writing it, just highlight and run. Exactly. So what if you want to add a field, Renee? What do you do? Do you open up the you know, UI and go look at object names? No, not really. So, I cheated a bit before this session. So what I can do is, like, I have my property, and you can see I have autocomplete for a custom object, right? So I'm creating my new object, which looks awesome. 
And let's do something with it. And you can see I even have all my custom fields here. So this is an autocomplete feature, also part of the Salesforce extensions for VS Code. Mm -hmm. You're getting it for free, but it includes, includes a manual step. Yeah. Right? You won't see this out of the box. If you try to just do this and expect the IntelliSense, it won't show up. Exactly. So there is a command which is called refresh as object definitions. You run this on a per project basis and it connects to your org and pulls down all standard objects and all custom objects as data locally to your project. You can see this in a folder which in .sfdx, tools as objects, and here are all my custom objects as well as my standard objects included. And the way that the CLI is doing this, you can see it looks a little weird. It's, it's pulling it down as .cls files, so it's not going to add it to, if you're then, Renee's going to get into pushing back to source or other, these other things. It's not actually adding extra Apex to anything. This is just for your local machine. It's a way for it to essentially search across files. That's how it's giving you that IntelliSense, is it's pulling it down as a .cls representation of your metadata, so it can find what you need as you're typing. Exactly, and while you look at the screen, you see that it's showing me that I have some errors, right? So right on the lines. So also the extensions give you the capability to get syntactic errors based on your Apex code. It is no local compile, just yeah. saying, right? And when you save, it's not executing a server-side compile that you will see that everything is totally right. fine, but you will get an error like, okay, this line is not correct. And for that, you can, uh, use the standard problems view, which gives you direct access to all those lines that error within your local Apex code. So what it is, is it's aware of Apex as a language, so it knows what constructs you're allowed to use. So if you try to use the wrong kind of loop construction, if you're using the wrong kind of end terminator, if you're formatting your Apex incorrectly, you're gonna get that on your local machine now, thanks to the language services. If you've misspelled a field, or you've misspelled an object, or you've referred to something that is not proper for the context, that's the part where the compile isn't happening on your machine. You're only gonna see that then once you do a push to your org you're working with. Exactly, for that we are using, or the engineering team is using a standard implementation of the language server protocol, which we deliver with every new release of Salesforce extensions, and which also can be used by other IDEs, right? So we're using a, a standard pattern, and as the Apex language evolves, like, who likes switch? Just asking. Switch statement, Apex, raise all your hands. No. Good, right? So this gets automatically added, so you can use it directly in the IDE. So I want to get rid of those errors now. I'm just removing this because I don't need it, and I'm getting also rid of my small thing. So one thing that I also like to do is, mm -hmm. when I write Apex, I want to test my Apex, right? If you write some, yeah, more, you know, a bit more than 15 lines. I just don't want to push that to my test org and then go in there and run, the t run my Apex and see if it works. Yes. So you remember the SQL query that you could execute? You're getting the exact same thing with Apex. You can just highlight any text as long as you're in a Salesforce DX project and run anonymous Apex with currently selected text or with the whole text in the file. So what basically happens is the, the IDE takes the text, puts it in the file, and uses the CLI to run anonymous Apex against that org. So again, if you wanted to just run some anonymous Apex, you could open up a new file, type in what you want to run, run it with that file. Exactly. So no more having to open up Workbench or the developer console you can stay in the IDE to do all that. All that, all for that. One last thing, so, because I like to have my aura enabled methods besides each other, right? You can just, just use something like the alt, the alt tab and the arrow keys to just remove your lines around because I just don't want to like to copy and paste my stuff around, right? But having said that, I created now some Apex and Zane likes always to double check the things that are right. So quadruple we check. Quadru quadruple check? Yeah, yeah, that's a Slack message that I'm getting at 5 a.m. in my morning. 
Okay, so you remember where we left our heroine on the app builder page with an, a component failing to display. So I'm going to get out of this session just, you know, for Cash's sake, and we'll get into the app builder again now that Renee has, in theory, fixed his apex. And we'll add our component back onto the page here. And now we're seeing it is looking better because there are no similar properties found according to now we have our design attributes, and we can see I'm searching by price here. So this is looking good. And in theory, I can switch this now. Those are the design attributes we added. We can search by price, or we can search by bedrooms. And I also want to make sure that this is working really well. As I said, I quadruple check Renee's work. So I'm going to go back into the IDE really quickly before I even get out of App Builder. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the Apex Replay Debugger to double check that the more complex query that we're using is holding values that we want and to make sure it's running the way I want. So I'm using here in the Explorer, I'm going to go into this built-in debugger that we're getting because when I installed that Salesforce extensions pack, I got access to that replay debugger, which means you're going to have access to it too. And the way you start using it is when you come into this debug functionality, we have a menu up top that right now, hold on, let me actually zoom for us. All right is saying no configurations. So I need to add a configuration. And what I'm doing when I add a configuration is I'm telling my installation of VS Code how to behave when it's stepping through a debug log. So I'm going to click Add Configurations. And the Salesforce extensions are already going to give me some help. And I'm going to choose the Apex, Apex Replay Debugger configuration. So then it's going to give me the proper JSON to make the Replay Debugger behave the way I need. That's all I have to do. I can save it, and you can see that where it adds it is now under this hidden VS Code file, I now have my launch.json. That's going to give me the ability to work with the replay debugger. Who's used or heard of the replay debugger? Awesome. Uncharted territory. OK. So I'm going to step through how we use it, and I, then you're, trust me, you're going to get it. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, the first thing I need to do is turn on a debug log. So I'm using my command palette again, and we're going to turn on a debug log for the replay debugger. Because as replay says, you're going to be able to step through it after it happens. This is not an interactive debugger. It's interactive in that I can see things and do things, but i got to have a session completed, and then I'm stepping through a log. So I've turned on a log, and now I'm going to go back into Salesforce. And one of my favorite things about App Builder is the fact that when you drag a component on a page, you're instantiating it. So if in your instantiation of that component, you're hitting the server and you're running Apex, guess what? You're going to generate a debug log without leaving App Builder. So I'm going to go ahead and drag my similar properties component back on the page again. And I have it here by price. I'm going to drag it on again. And I'm going to flip this to bedrooms. OK? So now I have two different components that ran, in theory, two different Apex queries. So I'm going to go back into my IDE now, and we're going to use the command palette to turn off our Apex debug log to stop recording. And now that I have some logs recorded, I need to pull them down to my local machine. So again, I'm using the command palette, and I'm going to use my get Apex debug logs. And then what the CLI is doing next is it's going to show me a menu of options because I recorded quite a few different logs. So I can't pull them all right now, but I'm going to just pull this last one, my latest log. And we can see that it's opening it here. And I'm going to close this part so that we can get a little more real estate. And so looks like a debug log, right? Very familiar. So I'm just right clicking. And I get another option here, you can see, to launch the replay debugger with the currently selected file. So when I choose that option, you can see we've gone back into the debugger, and now I have this little menu that I can drag around that's going to let me step through the log. So let's go ahead and do that. And as I step through the log, you can see down here, and I'll show you in a second, I've set breakpoints. So it's going to take me to my breakpoints in my apex. And as we keep stepping through, hey, look at what that is doing. It's showing me the exact line we're on. So if search criteria equals bedrooms, it's saying that we invoked that line. And I can see right here, these are all my variables and their value at the time the code was executing. And if we go look at Renee's code that he wrote, which is up on screen, there are no system.debug statements in there. 
That's another powerful thing about that replay debugger because the way it's watching your code execute is it's holding on to those values for you. So you don't have to go through and system.debug everything that you want to see the value of as you do it. So I can see right here that when I drug that component on the page and I change the design attribute to search by bedrooms, A, it worked. Good job. <laughs> B, I had five bedrooms on that property record page. I saw the price range and I saw that the price range variable was null and that it was behaving the way I needed. And I can do all of this by stepping through this replay debugger log. And Renee? I have two questions about why you're yeah. talking about that. I mean, it's awesome that my code works. I didn't expect anything else. So is it free? It is. So it just built in. It okay. is built in. The replay debugger is something that you get. You can use it to debug your code, to work with your code. It is, you do not pay an extra licensing fee. Exactly. And I mean, as a developer, I, it's awesome that I can just pull my own debug logs, but it's often like, you know, things happen in production. Yep. Right? If something doesn't work in production, how can we use it there? So if you, someone captures a debug log, sends you that log, you use the same feature that I just showed of open the debug log with the replay debugger. It can look at, if you have that launch.json in your project, it will know how to work with debug logs from Salesforce and you can use the replay debugger. So if someone has executed a session for you, you can step through it. Oh, that's super amazing. So yep. when it, so it never right? happens in production, right? But if it happens, I can debug it. You now. can debug it. And the last cool. thing I want to show is how easy it is to set breakpoints Let's say I want to add one here on line 28. I hover over onto the left of the line number, and I've added a breakpoint, or I've taken it away. And that's all you have to do. So I did that. I cheated, and I did it in the CLS file while Renee was talking so that I knew I would have breakpoints for us to hit and step through as I did the debugger. But you just click those breakpoints, execute your log, pull it down. It's that easy. So the last thing we need to do, oh, no, I am not done, sir. <laughs> The last thing we need to do, now that Renee's code is completely awesome, I'm responsible for getting us ready to check it into Git, which is what Renee's going to show us next. So very quickly, I'm going to run all the Apex tests. So it's built in here. We see that we have our little test uh, beaker, apparently, is the icon. And again, that's built into the extensions for Salesforce. I'm going to get rid of my debug logger. And we can see here, these are all the tests in our org. Renee and I obviously love writing tests. Um, and if I want to run all of them, I can just go ahead and click this, and we see I'm running all tests. I can run them by method. I have green dots because we obviously rehearsed this demo maybe recently, and so I have my last test run here as well. If they, things weren't well, we would see a red dot, and I can get all of the information about my tests, how they ran, what just happened. Again, right here in, this, in VS Code, I don't have to leave. Renee, your code looks good. <laughs> I'm turning it back to you. Thank you. Did you see this small comment over here? I can't delete it now, right? So Zane is not testing. She killed me for this. <laughs> so OK, my code is now ready to roll. And now it's time to move it to source control. Because this is the most important thing that you, as a Salesforce developer, should do nowadays. Move your code into source control. And VS Code has built-in functionality just right in the menu bar to show me which files have changed, which files are added, like you know it from Git, SVN, Perforce, whatever your, your preferred tool is. And it's pretty easy because you're getting, like here, a detailed view of the delta of the diff which you have between the, your previous commit and your currently local saved file, mm -hmm. right? And we can you know, easily save it from here, but as I'm efficient, I also like to do it inline. Right? When I work in code or when I you know, have my checks, this is an example, you see that we have a small green line over here, which indicates, oh, this is newly added code to this file. What's mostly overseen is I can click on this and I can inline, discard, or stage the changes. Right? I, can di I don't have to go to this view. I can say, oh, OK, my, my code looks, looks great. Yeah, I'm just going to commit it from here. Right? And this is just a blank line that we added. Ah, uh, no, just remove this. And also this blank line, I don't want to have that. And with that, I already went through all the necessary steps to add this file and those changes, because they're now, changed, now staged, 
um, to my sales control. So you can clean it up locally and don't have to then go into Git and try to clean up and reject in the UI there. <laughs> exactly. And I don't have to go through this overview page because sometimes there are 25 files in there and I want it to be just because in this file I'm pretty sure this code ran, I just want to add this part, this awesome. part of that file. What you also likely saw is when I hover over elements and it's really in light, like gray, that I have something like you a few seconds ago. Let's hover over this and it shows me that I changed it a few seconds ago. And I think this is one is from Zane, if I click over here, right? Mm -hmm. And I can, I can see in line, in my code, any commits that were previously on this file. And for this, we both love an extension which is called GitLens, which you can just install from the marketplace, which mm -hmm. gives me the capability of we're looking, oh, this is awesome, I want to see this. I can open this code directly in GitHub mm -hmm. if I want to, or if I also want to um, go deeper, I can take d a detailed look at my previous history, my previous Git commit history, which is even more important when you start moving your code into source control. Or working across distance as we are and, and asking, you know, who made that change and why did they do it? Exactly, so, so that I know whom I can send an email after I reverted it. Isn't he great? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we have a couple calls to action. Yeah, absolutely. So let's bring up PowerPoint. Everyone's favorite way to end a session. Oh, and I can stand up again. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, very first thing, Thursday, 1 p.m., Salesforce for Developers keynote. We have a couple of things to show you. You will see Zane speaking. I will be demo driving, and a few of our other colleagues will be also there in town. Yep. We you can't tell you what you will see, right? So please make sure to bookmark this session. Um, we have only limited availability, so go there and. And the next thing you should do, so this session and, a, and another one that Renee and I are presenting on Wednesday about modular app dev, which is how to get your stuff from in the org into source in ways that make sense, are part of a larger series of stuff on Salesforce DX about those tools and functionality of making developers more efficient. So this is the resources we have in Trailhead right now, the Getting Started with DX Trail. We're adding more all the time, and in fact, that package development readiness module is brand new, and it's gonna give you some resources about how do you even start thinking about packages? How do you start thinking about whether you're ready to do it? And how do you start checking your org for technical debt and or compatibility with packaging? It's gonna give you some strategies around that. So that's new on that trail. You should definitely check out the DX trail as well as the other DX sessions here for you. And we hope you have a fantastic Dreamforce. We have a couple minutes left that we can definitely take questions if you want. There's a Mick who wants to get up and ask. Yeah. You mentioned you um, can now use you mentioned that. Oh, sorry, we have two things. Sorry. Um, so, we'll let first, and then the actual person who went, went to the mic. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're good. No. Um, you guys mentioned you can now use VS Code the extensions without a DX project. Yeah. How do you go about that to create like Apex classes? Just, like, I'm coming over from Adam and David. Okay. Okay. So the question is, how can you use that with you know, with any kind of org, basically, right? Yeah. So, so if you would like to work, for example, against a standard sandbox. Right? You will still create locally a Salesforce DX project with yep. a CLI. It'll just be blank, it blank just, project. Just be blank. And th then you run a command, SFDX for source retrieve with a few parameters. And you would, for example, um, be able to pull down all your Apex classes yep. or data that you have, sp or metadata that you have specified <laughs> within a package XML. So there are two things. So we're going to show you how to do that in our session because there are some pitfalls to that. So, but you can start with a blank project and that will light up a whole series of CLI commands that you can use. You do not have to pull all of your stuff down onto your local machine to be able to then use the CLI. You could then create a new Apex class locally, push it back up, and you can work that way with just the new things you're creating on your machine, pushing it into your org, and that might be a lighter weight, better way to get started than trying to pull down some stuff without really being aware of what that retrieve command's gonna get you, if that makes sense. Yeah, yep. All right. You mentioned that one aspect of the tooling was free. What mm -hmm. isn't free? Nothing we have shown here okay. is it costs. The CLI is yours. It's free. There are some interactive debugging uh, tools that we didn't show that do come with some costs because they're pretty compute intensive. But everything we showed is yours. And you can get it today. 
It is recorded, and we're doing it again on Friday. If you want to see us again, Friday at noon. Down. Um, as, a, uh, as a developer, we're not using DX. We're not u yet using CS uh, command line interface. What are the prerequisites to start using VS Code? Download VS Code. Do we have to have CLI set up? Do we have to have? Yes. I mean, you so you can use VS Code. If you want to be able to work efficiently with your Salesforce stuff, you're going to want to get that extensions pack that we talked about and, that, and, and install the CLI. So you're going to want to do those things because right now the goodness of DX is mostly exposed through the CLI. That's how you get at it. But the CLI is then, that's how you can run queries, execute anonymous. You don't have to be using some of the application lifecycle stuff like scratch orgs. You don't have to go there yet. OK. So once we have CLI, we're good to go? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. So the, the question was, because we're also recording it so people know, that our IDEs looked a little bit different than like when you download Visual Studio Code and, and what were those changes? And Renee? Well, you can make it your own. We just changed the theme mm -hmm. to, to make it light. Um, and I, then we each installed some extensions. Yeah. So that's really how you start doing it. I have another font, font running than Zane, for example, right? It's just my IDE. It's my playground. It's my thing. So I want to make it my own. One quick thing. So how about we have admins and developers in the teams, right? How about mix and matching with admin changes that's happening in the org? Mm -hmm. So how VS Code can help there? That, so that's, so there are two things around that. It depends on what's, so the question of, again, what's on your local machine? And when you're running, say, a poll or a retrieve, then what shows up as a diff will then depend on what you have on your machine. So that's where then getting modular is going to help you. Um, so tomorrow at 5 o'clock, we're talking about some of that. But the other part where it can help is a lot of what Renee was showing with then Git commit and source tracking, is the fact that you can pull now more things down to your machine against more kinds of orgs. As people are working declaratively, if I would saved that application page and activated it, you, Renee could have pulled that change down because it's reflected in metadata, so you can get that all into source. So it really depends on how are you pulling things out of your org and how are you getting into source. That's where it matters. Uh, oh. Did you force us push to the same shared scratch or was this just a shortcut for them? Or? Well, it's a great question. Yeah, for rehearsals we did. We just did a shortcut here for the session. And yeah. how do you technically? Well, how, how can you share? Um, you you can share a scratch org. You can share a scratch org. You can. Um, you yeah. might notice some strange side effects with push and retrieve. We, we noticed that even just in prepping for the session. But you can share, like Renee shared the, the OAuth token with me. Right. And I just authenticated into the same one. You, you can just you know, change the regular credentials, or you can run a false auth display with uh, the verbose parameter, mm -hmm. which gives you the fourth auth URL. And that you can share that with, okay. with someone else. Yep. We can just store that as a local uh, alias. So well. Renee and I need to pack up to be good to the next presenter who needs to get on stage. But we'll meet you out in the hall and take the rest of your questions. Thanks.